There's a saying in the autistic community that goes, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Autism is a spectrum, meaning every aspect of it affects every autistic person differently. Some people have debilitating social ineptitude, while some may thrive in a social setting, and others may have difficulty socializing, but have perfected the art of pretending. On the surface and in the uneducated public, only one of these people would be considered obviously autistic. But this idea is, at best, blissfully ignorant and misinformed. So then, if no one autistic person has the same experience as another, how do we represent it in media? What qualifies as good or bad representation? And who gets to decide which is which? Honestly, I'll save you some time and tell you that I can't answer those. I'm only one person, and this sort of thing requires a bit more than a black and white answer from some stranger on the internet. I would, however, like to talk about the autistic coding and representation in Rise of the TMNT's Donatello, a character who was more or less confirmed to be autistic by writer Ron Corsillo. I mentioned in my previous video that I wanted to tackle this subject separately, and that's because there is a lot to unpack about this topic. Not just because of Donnie specifically, but also because of what he represents in media. Though the word autistic is never said in the show, let alone in reference to Donnie, and the only real confirmation we have are these tweets, the coding and nuance behind Donnie's depiction are obvious if you know what to look for and who to listen to. So the real question here isn't, is Donnie autistic, but rather, is Donnie a good portrayal of autism? And is Donnie a stereotype? According to the Center of Disease Control and Prevention, autism spectrum disorder is defined as a developmental disability caused by differences in the brain. People with ASD often have problems with social communication and interaction and restricted or repetitive behaviors or interests. People with ASD may also have different ways of learning, moving, or paying attention. Which is a pretty sterile and oversimplified way to describe it, but in their defense, autism is pretty complicated. It's hard to truly explain what it's like to be autistic because we either lack the ability to articulate it, or because autism is still so misunderstood that the signs of it go completely unnoticed. It's important to note that there is a bit of a bias when it comes to professional diagnosis as well. AMAB people tend to be diagnosed at a higher rate, while AFAB people go under the radar despite autism occurring at about an equal rate in both groups. This has a lot to do with things like research bias and the cultural expectations surrounding each group that affects things like how autistic attributes present themselves and how they're socially received. It's really hard to fully grasp and definitively say what is and is not an attribute of autism with our current understanding of it as a society. But some of the most common traits of autistic people can include, to some varying degree, a difficulty navigating social interaction, repetitive behavior, self-stimulatory behavior, also known as stimming, sensory sensitivity, special interest, Interests, the ever stigmatized low empathy and the lesser known high empathy, and the infamous and severely misunderstood meltdown and shutdown. I'd like to preface my own feelings on this by saying that, in my humble opinion, the conversation surrounding autism and autism awareness is simultaneously way too narrow and way too broad for autistic people to understand. Public education and awareness around autism may be well intentioned, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's correct. As I said, every autistic person's experience is different, and that's because we're all individuals. And yet, autism as a whole gets treated as a very monolithic neurodivergence. But how can you take the experience of a nonverbal autistic child who will need constant care for the rest of their life and compare it to an industry professional that may fully be capable of an independent life, but struggles with things like clothing textures, company dinners, or disrupted routines? Both are labeled as autistic, but their experiences are completely separate from one another. Ironically, because of this attempt to use an umbrella term, the spectrum as we know it becomes a confusing and restricting reference because in identifying one, we sometimes end up leaving out the other. The lack of education surrounding autism awareness is surprisingly narrow-minded, considering that the CDC estimates a global autistic population of about 75 million people. However, research and knowledge surrounding autism expand each year, and as accurate understanding increases, it's suspected that even that estimate is low. It's also a debate within the community on whether or not autism should be considered a disorder at all. Autism is categorized as a developmental disorder, but in many cases, autistic people don't see their autism as being something wrong with them. The biggest issue we run into usually has more to do with the way our society and cultures are centered around holistic thinking and, by extension, reject autistic thinking, and less to do with wishing we could just be more holistic. The idea of a cure is often presented as a goal in the understanding of autism, or at the very least in the suppression of symptoms, which is also a debatable term, rather than learning how to begin reforming a society that accommodates both autistic and holistic people equally. With that in mind, whether or not you believe in the cure, suppression, or accommodation 
of autism. Every autistic person is impacted negatively by stereotypes and misinformation perpetuated by media, organizations, and psychologists who simply don't have the knowledge of what it's like to actually be autistic. Autism in media, be it books, dramas, movies, or cartoons, is usually made by and for allistic people. That means that up until very recently, autism has been portrayed as a plethora of stereotypes, both well-intentioned and grossly ignorant. From the prodigious savants to the burdensome but innocent autistic family members, stereotypes about autistic people are more often than not riddled with the bitter aftertaste of being the butt of a joke or being a spectacle. Some, even while trying to push an attempt at a wholesome lesson, or tick off that little diversity quota. Alternatively, we get a story that centers around the autistic person's allistic caretaker. Their loved one's autism is an addition to a laundry list of things that just make their allistic life harder, which end up being little more than ableist feel-good movies that don't really feel great for autistic people to watch. Other times, we see characters that are meant to be presented as autistic, but fall into a stereotype of the savant. This usually has the result of taking the concept of a special interest and making the autistic character an exceptional mind in that field. Even with extraordinary skills, though, these characters are typically still displayed as having an odd social presence that sometimes ends up being poked at or antagonized for laughs. Now, that's not to say that real-life savants don't exist. They definitely do. But this too often gets used as a version of what a good autistic person would be based on what they can contribute to an allistic-based society. These characters may not necessarily be negative, but still feed into the stereotype, such as Dr. Spencer Reed from Criminal Minds or Wu Young Wu in The Extraordinary Attorney Wu, which is more accurately translated to The Weird Attorney Wu. Two characters whose incredible knack for law, memorization, and problem solving make them exceptional assets to their teams, but their other behaviors are still framed as being odd or perhaps even hard to get along with. Other characters display autistic traits and connect with an autistic audience, but still may have a couple of thorns, like Mr. Spock from the Star Trek series or Jala Madrav from Mass Effect Andromeda. One is from an alien race that rejects emotion in favor of logic and reason. All right. There's something wrong about a man who never smiles, whose conversation never varies from the routine of the job, and who won't talk about his background. I see. Spock. I mean that it's, uh, it's odd for a non-Vulcan. Um, the ears make all the difference. I find your argument strewn with gaping defects in logic. While the other comes from a race that embraces emotion with jarring honesty. The Angara seem so open and free with their feelings. Are we? Hmm. We're certainly not ashamed of our feelings. We're taught that feelings and beliefs should live on the outside, where they can be dealt with honestly and openly. Don't people get hurt? Of course. Then everyone deals with it. That's the point. Neither race understands the human way of communicating or feeling, be it that they feel at all or that they don't feel honestly enough. The thorn that I mentioned here, though, is that both of these characters, despite displaying traits that autistic people find relatable and maybe even comforting, is that they're aliens and the thing that makes them inhuman are the things that autistic people relate to. Now, this isn't to say that every autistic person is done badly or that relating to any of the aforementioned characters is a bad thing. Characters like Dr. Reed and Wu Young Wu are good representations of someone. They wouldn't be so widely loved by the autistic community otherwise, and their stories still have good things about them, like Dr. Reed's struggle with trauma and how it's affected by his impeccable memory, or how Wu Young Wu's romantic interest doesn't think she needs to change to be lovable. Fantasy races like the low empathy Vulcan or the high empathy Angara are shown to have value in their way of thinking and enrich their teams because of their views. This is more to say that the portrayal of autism is complicated and still in the early stages of figuring out how to write it effectively, inoffensively, and more diversely. With all of that said, Donnie is widely hailed as an example of excellent autistic representation. He's never explicitly stated to be autistic in Rise, but the coding and traits are definitely there. Like, it's there's no way that I was supposed to look at him and think, ah yes, what a perfectly neurotypical individual. His autism is present in every scene, and yes, I do mean every scene. So buckle up because there's quite a few of them. I think the most obvious trait of his is his obsession with technology and science, which could easily qualify as 
that's his special interests. He loves working on his tech, it takes up a lot of his mental space, and he shows a clear sense of reward when he's engaging with it. He also gets pretty territorial about his interests, which may be a combination of being his special interests and his insecurities that I'll touch on later, but this still comes across as an autistic trait to me. He has a voice inflection that sometimes comes off as odd to others, or uses a tone of voice that conveys a completely different message than what he means. Oh sure, let me just load my tap into every security camera in New York app. I'm sorry if that sounded like sarcasm, it wasn't, I am in and has trouble controlling his volume when he's talking about something he really likes. This, combined with his extensive vocabulary and rigidly correct grammar, comes across as a very autistic way of speaking. He's shown to have a bit of a hard time regulating his more intense emotions, be them positive or negative. He's an abysmally terrible liar and takes things very literally. Uh, nothing. Just having a typical, normal, mystic-free day. What? I said mystic free! He has what we would call safe foods. He tends to prefer to stick to what he knows, like choosing to stick with his bow in the first episode, and gets upset with things he can't understand, like his brother's mystic abilities. I also feel like the way he has a really hard time breaking the montage spell in Clothes Don't Make the Turtle because the song just slaps too hard is very autistic. Okay, hey, let's get out of here. I'm sure if we all work together- Donnie, would you focus? Sorry! You know if an 80s jam is on, the rhythm's gonna get me! I don't know, this one is mostly a feeling. We see him doing little behaviors that could be identified as happy stimming, like the little dance he does in the layer games, or the super exciting way he moves in the purple jacket. Especially the spinning. The, the spinning is a big one. We also see him doing little things when he's upset that I clock as distress stimming, like in Todd Scouts when he's scratching at himself or rocking back and forth. While on the subject of the Todd Scouts episode, I'd like to bring up how Donnie specifically takes to this sudden change the worst out of all of his brothers. I would actually dare to categorize this scene as an autistic meltdown, or at least the the beginning of one. This is one of the most misunderstood and demonized aspects of autism, often mistaken as a tantrum or as people being spoiled. This is not only a harmful concept, but just blatantly not true. Meltdowns are usually the result of an autistic person losing control of their self-regulation in an overwhelming situation or of overstimulation. It could be one big trigger that set them off or a bunch of minor things piling up together. Routine and adequate time for mental prep for major changes is often vital to autistic people's ability to regulate ourselves. If we are not given that heads up, it can throw us into a panic-induced meltdown depending on the circumstances. Donnie's reaction in this scene can kind of come off as just a look at the tech guy without his tech gag, but I actually read this as him being completely stripped of his comfort items in an environment he's fully unfamiliar with in a situation he's never been in before. He continually pushes that he needs his comfort items back, even after his brothers had accepted their woodland fate. Hey, look at us! We don't even need our phones for this one super specific mission! But in general, and I cannot make this clear enough, I need my phone. And goes to extreme lengths to bring some familiarity into the situation. And only after bringing back that sense of control over the situation was he able to rein his self control back in. Also on the topic of the Todd Scouts episode, the scene where Donnie uses American Sign Language to communicate with the squirrels connects with a lot of autistic people because it alludes to the possibility of Donnie using ASL during non-verbal episodes, which can happen from time to time even in verbal autistic people as a result of a meltdown. He's also shown to be very proficient at reading lips, which may very well be something he just learned how to do, but can also read as a way that he would consciously or unconsciously accommodate auditory processing issues that commonly occur with autistic people. We don't actually get to see him use either of these things in this way, but the inclusion of that moment still vibes with the autistic audience. Some people struggle with motor skill development at an early age that they may or may not age out of later, but if we take the Layer Games episode and the Turtle Tots short into consideration, Donnie definitely showed signs of that lack of ability when he was young. While we're on the topic of motor skills, I'd like to touch a little on Donnie's weapon. I talked a lot in my other video about how much I like the switch to a titanium staff and how he gets utilized much better as a formidable fighter in Rise, and I definitely stand by that, but I also think that his staff is an interesting asset to this specific version of Donnie. Bojutsu is a weapon art that heavily emphasizes the building of the body and motor control. Understanding the staff as an extension of oneself is essential to effectively using it, which is why the techniques to use it emphasize proficiency with the hands rather than focusing on the weapon itself. Like any weapon, it requires regular and disciplined practice to master, but the bow uniquely relies on the user's understanding of their own body and their opponents to utilize momentum and flow, like dancing, which he also really likes. This this may very well not have been intentional, and maybe I'm reading a little too far into this, but I find it interesting that Rise's Donnie, who would theoretically struggle with motor control and needs most things to tie into one or more of his special interests, would find proficiency in a weapon that allows him to feel more in tune with his body and would allow him to use his understanding of physics to make his fighting style more effective. Because he's physically proficient enough to pull this move off, but 
Still can't make even one shot in basketball? I don't know, just a thought. Another big thing that actually plays a pretty big part into his physical characterization is his aversion to touch, whether that's out of his need for cleanliness or a sensory problem. He doesn't do well with affection that he doesn't initiate or touch that comes right after a high stress ordeal, but sometimes in calmer situations, he seems to be more or less okay with it from his family. The metal arm extensions that he uses do a lot of the work for him in this regard. He's also shown to react really strongly to things touching him that look like they would be gross, which same. I also think that his design as a soft shell turtle plays a lot into this. But his shell being sensitive to touch makes for a really good visual display of what his sensory issues feel like. Also, Donnie really is the MVP in this one, because if this had to happen to me, I think I would simply turn to dust. Good luck with the Krang, everyone. And finally, probably one of the most difficult and stigmatized aspects to actually write about autistic people is displayed in Donnie's low empathy. This is something that gets regularly praised in Rise's writing, which brings us to the next segment. So with all of these traits and moments in mind, is Donnie a good representation of autism? I would argue, yes. And I mean, really everyone already knows he is, but why? What makes Donnie stand out? Well, to start, Donnie is shown to have low empathy, but not no empathy, nor does he come off as an emotionless wall. Donnie definitely has a lot of feelings. He can come off as distant or cold at times, but it's very clear that he loves and treasures his family and their dynamic. He, like many autistic people, just has a hard time articulating his feelings or having heart-to-hearts due to his general inability to feel for people or have an emotionally comforting presence. He has a bit of an aversion to emotional vulnerability that isn't on the tail end of an offhanded joke. I think this is best highlighted in his moments with Mikey, where Mikey displays a high empathy way of thinking while Donnie displays low empathy. Count your unhatched fowl. My record stands until you reach the top, which, according to my calculations of wind speed, barometric pressure, and dew point, is highly unlikely. What? According to my calculations, as long as you believe in yourself, you can do anything! Neither are displayed as inherently wrong or right, but rather just as different approaches to a situation. Mikey is easily able to put himself in someone else's place, and tries to approach almost every situation almost exclusively through emotion. Donnie does not. Instead, he logically understands that a situation or a circumstance is sad or upsetting and reacts in a way that makes sense to him but at no point does he think he's better than anyone else for being more logically minded. I think the closest we come to this idea is in the episodes Mind Meld and Donnie vs. Witchtown. But in Mind Meld, the conflict comes more out of Donnie's frustration at being the only one to come up with solutions and follow through with them, especially concerning things he cares a lot about, but his brothers don't. Not on the same page, huh? Well, I think the problem is while I come up with brilliant plans, you guys just goof around like dum-dums. <laughs> While Donnie vs. Witchtown is more about his insecurity about his place on the team as the tech guy, if magic could just as easily replace him. Cuz, I'm the science guy. If mystic powers can do everything I can do but better, then why would you guys even need me? In short, Mind Meld covers the frustration over an uneven workload, and Donnie vs. Witchtown displays lashing out over an insecurity. In neither situation does Donnie believe he's truly better than his brothers or Witchtown because of the way he thinks, which is incredibly important in this type of character. He's also not narrowed down to his special interests like many autistic characters are. He isn't even shown to necessarily have only one interest. Sure, the most obvious ones are tech and science, but he's also shown to be a huge sci-fi fan, a huge Lujitsu fan, and more than once displays a great affinity for for music and dance. It's not unusual for autistic people to have more than one special interest, some having absolutely nothing to do with one another, just like all autistic people have multiple hobbies and interests. It's refreshing to see him displayed as having varied interests and his value as a character not being so materialistic. On the opposite end of his special interest, Donnie also has a very unique relationship with the thing that he starts out being skeptical over and even having a resentment towards, the mystic. Now, we don't actually get a concrete explanation of what the mystic elements of Rise actually in tail, but for the sake of argument and a Mikey analysis that I might want to make later, we're going to assume that magic in this universe is driven by emotion. So with that in mind, Donnie's development of his mystic ability is actually a really great allegory for his emotional development and overall character growth. For someone who struggles with naming, showing, controlling, and utilizing his emotions, it makes perfect sense that a magic system that relies on 
all of those things is difficult for him to grasp, at least at first. But over time, as Donnie learns more about himself and his family, he learns to be more confident in himself, his own abilities, and finds more security in how he feels. I find it interesting that we don't actually get to see Donnie fully realize his own powers until the final episode of the series. This is kind of a shame since we don't get to see him use his powers as much as the others, but I think the fact that he was able to unlock this part of himself because he and his brothers tore down a metaphorical wall between them and their understanding of one another says a lot about his character. Now, how does this prevent Donnie's powers from coming off as a sort of mythical cure for his autism? Well, we've already established that Donnie is not emotionless, just driven by logic. So it's fully possible for him to learn how to use this power. However, I think what really made a huge difference here is that Donnie's mystic ability is very different from his brother's in that it was designed to be a mystic tech combo. According to a tweet by Ron Corsillo, Donnie was originally intended to have a fully mystic ability, but Donnie's voice actor Josh Brenner suggested that this would be pretty out of character for Donnie, so this idea was scrapped. And thank god, because I actually really love this tech mystic combo. It looks cool, it feels in character, and it really works for the connection that I'm about to make. I've connected the two dots. You didn't connect shit, but I've connected them. I really like that Donnie's power wasn't purely mystic, because I think that the concept of magic versus science, our theoretical pathos versus logos in this situation, was a major personal personal conflict in his development. The fact that he didn't have a magical sudden understanding of the mystic, thus giving us the science Donnie versus the magic Donnie, but rather a way that his understanding and view of the world allowed him to embrace magic his way, on his terms, with confidence and agency, and is portrayed as being just as powerful and badass as his brothers, makes a world of difference. So great, Donnie's arguably a good portrayal of autism. I suppose the final question would be, is Donnie a stereotype? And I guess? Yes. Remember when I said that autistic representation is a lot more than a black and white answer? This is what I meant. I think Donnie could technically fall under the savant stereotype, but at the same time, I really don't feel like that's the case here. Because Donnie isn't just a brilliant scientist or innovative machine guy. His personality expands way past that into parts of his character that don't feel relevant, but let him feel like a person. That's the most important part. Donnie feels like a person. He has conflicts and setbacks and growth that even involves directly tackling his value and self-worth as a person. The other characters don't treat him as though something is wrong with him or that he needs to fix something about his personality. Even the way his powers were designed emphasizes that Donnie is wonderful just the way he is. The fact that Donnie is way more than his materialistic contribution to whatever autistic logic powers he can bestow on them is what sets him apart and allows him to be a character that just so happens to be autistic rather than the autistic character. Ultimately, I think this is what we're looking for, to be seen as just as complex and nuanced as neurotypical characters because we're individuals too. We each have our own stories and our own experiences and they deserve to be heard and seen just as much as everyone else's. I honestly have no idea if Donnie's portrayal was meant to connect with so many autistic people and be read as such an excellent display of autism autistic presence and acceptance. I mean, I kind of hope it was because otherwise that's one hell of a coincidence. But I guess if it wasn't, maybe it means we're a little closer to understanding each other than we realize. <laughs>